begin with prayer as well. God, we just ask simply that your spirit would move in all of our hearts, God. And that's all we ask. That's all we need. So help us all now, in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm not afraid to die. I just don't want to be there when it happens, said Woody Allen, famous comedian. In this world, nothing can be more certain except death and taxes. Benjamin Franklin, famous inventor. The studies have been done, and the stats are now in that precisely 100% of all people will die. Through one man, Adam, death was inherited by all. The first death involved Cain killing his brother Abel. It was grisly, it was gruesome, and it brought with it the sting in its tail that at that time could not be tamed. Imagine, if you will, the way it was, just like Johan was talking about before, the relationship between Adam and Eve and God, a perfect relationship, pure joy, everything the way it should be, being able to worship God rightly. Sin and death caused the first separation experience for mankind. For thousands of years now, death has had a hold on people. It has caused pain and uncertainty as they deal with the loss of loved ones, particularly those who didn't want any part of Christ in their lives. It has caused many sleepless nights and wonderings about the afterlife, and caused many people to follow false teachings about how best to get there, live a good life, give this, do that, pray this, recite that, the list goes on. This thing that death has in its tail can be extremely overpowering, unbearable almost. At least that is, unless Christ has revived your soul from the dead. All of a sudden there's action and commotion on flight 262 to Paris. They crowd around a passenger down near the front and Dr. Sangalou sits near the back reading his magazine. He wonders what's going on. Things get more and more frantic. And then over the loudspeaker, the flight attendant calls. Is there a doctor on board? Please come to the front. We need you now. Well, he takes action, this doctor. And he breaks into a fast run down the aisle. The patient has a grey complexion and is cold and clammy. No pulse, not breathing. He's what you'd call dead. Still, there's hope. The doctor knows what to do and is the one with the power to do it. Much like Jesus in Lazarus' situation, when all seems lost, Dr. Sangalou applies the palm of his hand to the chest of the man and masterfully manipulates the heart. The man is brought back to life from the dead. In God's word, we see Martha and Mary in great despair at the sudden loss of their brother. Lazarus is also known to Jesus. The bond between them all is obviously very strong. Maybe you know all too well the pain of losing a sibling like this yourself, you rightly mourn their loss and sudden lack of their presence, especially if taken suddenly from you. Right then, at that moment, death can certainly pack a sting, and may do so for, for a very long time to come, but thankfully not for eternity. Right away we see the faith the woman had. She believed that only if Jesus had been there a little earlier, he would have saved their brother. You can almost sense a little annoyance or disappointment in her voice as all seems lost now yes i've heard of and probably seen people or heard of people healed from sickness but as far as they know lazarus time on earth has ended jesus simply goes on to say in verse 23 your brother will rise again being a believer she replies yes i know he'll rise again on the last day in the resurrection then jesus said to her i am the resurrection and the life and the one who believes in me will live, even though they die. Whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Jesus says to her. And also to us, the congregation, do we believe this? We of course know what, what happens next in the following minutes. Jesus, being moved by the death and sorrow of the people, weeps. And he feels the loss for his brother showing us that we too should rightly mourn the loss of a loved one. Then on his command, Lazarus is raised. Lazarus, come out, Jesus says. And he comes to life. Death is overcome for the first time Martha and Mary experience and testify to the fact that because of Jesus, death in fact doesn't have the powerful sting it once had. 
So what about you and I? When we face the prospect of death in the future, whenever that may be, does worry and despair consume us? If it does, it may be that we have not yet been healed by the great physician, Jesus. For he brings healing and assurance to his children. Why, why wait a moment longer? If you hear his voice now, don't harden your hearts, as his word tells us to do. Repent of your sins and follow him. God's perfect timing. We can all be frustrated when people don't come, come to our aid straight away, and sometimes they come too late to help us at all. Well, here we see that both Martha and Mary believed that the best outcome was that Jesus arrive immediately and that their brother Lazarus would be made well from his sickness. They were definitely not wrong in wanting this, but what we notice here about Jesus is that his plans for death and salvation and healing are far, far greater and often far different to ours, to our ideal plan. He, of course, cares deeply for his children and knows our deepest needs even before we've asked. But what was foremost on his mind was the glory of the Father and for the kingdom. Someone being healed from a sickness was amazing, of course, and people were somewhat familiar with hearing of this occurrence in those times. You can imagine some people hearing the stories from afar of people being healed and thinking, oh, what's to say they just didn't come right in their own time? There would have been some doubters for sure when some people were healed with a sickness. But Jesus, in his wisdom, in perfect timing, in Lazarus' death, had the most impact possible on the people at the time. And also you and I as we read it today. This was no sick man. This was a dead man. To the people in the area, there was absolutely no denying Jesus' work. The previous naysayers would have been gobsmacked four days dead and buried. Then Lazarus appears on command from the tomb. This is surely the saviour, they would have said. If you were looking on that day, what would you have said about Jesus? More importantly, what do you say in your heart about Jesus now on hearing this story? All things happen in his time and in his way. Today, Jesus' timing is just as perfect. He will always do the perfect thing at the perfect time. How perfect was the timing when he resurrected your dead body if you know him today? You'll remember it fondly, and not one, one of us will say, well, I could have thought up a better time or place or a plan for my life when he saved me. His time and his way, it's always the best way. One more thing we can all agree on here is that Lazarus' death, although painful at first, points all glory to God. It blows away all fear of death as we see Jesus has all power over death. Do you see this demonstration of God's perfect timing and control of death in this situation? Do you see God's masterful plan wait in waiting four whole days to prove his resurrection power? This must surely give us more confidence in the face of death then, and also more confidence that God's plan and timing are to be trusted. What will our response be to God when the next calamity comes upon us will you rest in him knowing that he is for you and not against you the saved can't remain stung with fear the saved can't remain stung with fear and the next so the next thing we can draw from this passage is that if you're saved by Christ it's impossible for the eternal sting of death to remain with you We've all encountered people who are petrified at the prospect of passing away. Maybe that was you. For them, death has its grip on them and strips them of much joy and hope of the future. Recently, I was struck by the polar opposite of this terrifying position in my granddad um, passing away this, this year. Granddad, in his 93rd year, was getting closer and closer to the end of his race. We knew he was looking forward to what was coming next. And so were we, as he edges way closer to being with his Saviour. Sure, there would be sorrow in not having him here with us on earth, but the terrifying sting of death was dealt with, as he was found in Christ. Jesus was his, his awesome power, and, the, and so Jesus' awesome power and love had taken that sting and replaced it with a heart of thankfulness and worship for the life of Grandad 
that live for him? Would there be more of a sting present if I had lost a wife or a child instead when I was attending their funeral? Yes, I'm sure there would have been more of a sting at that time. But God can tame and conquer any sting death brings. Jesus' actions all throughout the Bible, his power to forgive and especially the power in raising people to life gave me huge, huge confidence. As we walked down the aisle behind his coffin, I saw many believers in attendance and we were able to make eye contact and even enjoy a bit of a smile and a nod as we walked past each other. We know, we both knew the same thing, that our granddad was a believer and so were we and we'll see him again one day. I vividly remember having the words of Paul from Colossians ringing loud and clear in my mind during that service. Death has no sting. I was looking forward to worshipping God for his goodness and being thankful for Granddad's life. It was close to two hours of awesome testimony of what God had done in his life. I wasn't stung by the death, but only because Granddad and I had been saved. This knowledge changed the whole perspective of the situation for all in Christ. Likewise, Phil Snedden, a new believer at the time, attended the funeral of our sister Catherine, Catherine Smith. There are many, many powerful things said at that funeral, as you know, by George and, and their children about the Lord's goodness, but also about, how the, about the peace that Catherine had upon first seeing the tumour on her brain that the doctors showed her on the screen. The tumour would, in a matter of a month or so, take her to be with her saviour. Her very words were broadcast by George to hundreds in attendance and more around the world. I'm in God's hands now, she said confidently and matter-of-factly. Every funeral Phil had been to was in stark contrast to this. They had been void of all hope of the Saviour, and there was no joy or hope, well, not like this anyway. You know the funerals I'm talking about, we've been to them. You feel so sad coming away from a funeral like that. Phil was amazed by it, as we were too. The promises of God to his children at that time were like nothing else. Experiencing and understanding it causes you to draw nearer to God. It makes you sing the, sims, sorry, the, the hymns in the service with real passion and real meaning. You feel a lump in your throat as the emotions kick, kick in, not always in sadness, but because you know the truths that you are singing are real and that God is trustworthy and faithful to all his children. It brings comfort to the believer and also shows a powerful witness to the non-believers. In God's hands, indeed. What more can you ask for but for a family member to be in the presence of God at the end of their race? It's situations like this that reinforce to us that yes, death has most certainly lost its sting. By God's grace, the saved are unable to remain stung forever by the prospect of death because of Christ's work on the cross for us. Our original state. You and I needed raising from the dead too. Just like Lazarus, we couldn't have been any more dead in our original state, could we? Stone cold dead, no pulse, flatlining, flat out dead. The Lord reveals to us that yes, this is exactly how it is. When you are dead in your trans trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our trespasses, having cancelled the debt ascribed to us in the decrees that stood against us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. Those words are from Colossians 2.13. We were dead, not just unwilling to get up and move, but totally unable. A dead man can't do a single thing of his own accord. We know that. We're dead without the King of Glory doing something for us. He resurrected Lazarus and he can resurrect us from the original state. So the everlasting sting and fear of death will be dealt with forever. Just as we read, God declares that he starts the work in us. Just like he started the heart and the lungs of Lazarus, Lazarus had no say in the matter first of all. God did it all. Yes, we must respond, but he starts the whole process. God comes to the dead, the transgressors, the weak, the lowly, because that's the love of the Father for his children. Then in the process of awakening your dead body, 
He pulls out mercy and grace. And he reveals to you the Lamb, Jesus, that was slain on the cross. Every iniquity and every sin, everything is thrown on the Lord Jesus, who is innocent and perfect. So that in repenting of our sin and wanting to change, you acknowledge him as your king. You're set free. Free of the punishment of sin and also free of the sting of eternal death. Free to worship him in this life and the next. So what about you? Are you still lying motionless in the tomb, like Lazarus was, in that dead original state? Or have you responded to this call and run to the Saviour? This is urgent. Why not respond now, if you haven't already? There might not be tomorrow. Now for some application points. Where to from here? There's much encouragement we can take from this account of God's word and his power over death. But what are some basic action steps we can take? Like Lazarus, we too have family members, friends and workmates who are spiritually dead and will not acknowledge the Saviour in their present state without God's intervention. Three quick action steps. SBS. The first S. One thing you, you and I can do then is send for help. Call for help on their behalf like Martha and Mary did. They sent for Jesus, the only one who could do anything. Nothing has changed since that day. You need to pray that the Lord would revive them, or revive you if that's the case. Yes, it's true that God uses our witness and, and our actions and our love towards others for his kingdom to reach others. But the first port of call must always be to call on the name of the Lord for others. B. Secondly, we must be patient and respect God's perfect timing and plans. Trust God that he'll move at the right time. Remember, Mary and Martha wanted Jesus right there, right away, to heal Lazarus, to keep him from death. But Jesus came much later, when, all, when it seemed all hope was lost. It seemed like an impossibility to them. When you start to feel like this, that the situation or the person is too far gone, out of Jesus' reach, that people are just too impossible, just remember, you and I are pretty good, far gone too, weren't we? We were just as dead. No one is too far gone for God to touch their lives. So start with sending for help, being patient, and lastly, the last S, speak. Our attitude and response on the subject of life and death can also be really powerful and useful in proclaiming who God is and what he's done. Remember, when the world hears of death, it's generally shrouded in sadness and despair and void of all hope. How different it must sound then to their ears when you speak of a recent funeral or a Christian friend who is nearing the end of their race, who is confident in the Saviour and even embraces the coming death. What a witness! Some will be struck by this and they'll want it for themselves. Others maybe won't be moved and don't want to know. But that's okay, remember, it's Jesus who commands the dead to rise and the souls to be awakened, not us. So send for help, be patient, and speak of hope. In closing, to many the start of this sermon sounded very morbid. And indeed it was, we were talking about death without Christ after all. But just as our lives begin and are conceived in darkness, we can finish now with a wonderful hope that stirs praise within us. Praise to our Father who has conquered sin and death with himself being triumphantly raised on the third day. We can now say with absolute certainty death is swallowed up in victory. Will the words you utter from your mouth this day resemble that of Caesar Borgia, an Italian nobleman? While I lived, I provided for everything but death. Now I must die and I am unprepared to die. He was scared. Or will you, safe in the arms of Jesus, be able to join with the saints and say things like these? King David, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. And also the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 15. O oh death, where is your victory? O oh death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Amen. Let's pray. God, we're thankful for what you've given us. We're thankful for life that you have freely given to us through Jesus. We think this is available for all who would who would see him as king and who would see how they've fallen short in their own life. Father, we thank you that um, all fear is gone as you've taken it away completely. Thank you for the hope you, you give us even in death that one day we'll be with you. One day we'll praise you with those that have gone before us that are in you. Thank you for the joy that that'll bring. We pray for those especially that are struggling with um, the loss of loved ones and the sting of death is probably quite evident if it's been quite recent too, God, and we pray for comfort for them. But Lord, that you would, uh, in your ways, um, point them to the everlasting hope that we have in Christ. I thank you for the, the healing that you bring, your power over death. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.